Welcome back. I hope everyone is uh, nourished and, um, and you, you, you stretched your legs uh, if, if you aren't already standing up. Um, I'm really, really excited. You know, um, I think there were some great conversations happening at the tables from what I heard. And um, we now get to kind of bring it to another perspective. Um, um, I just had the opportunity to meet our next, uh, our next speaker, guest, panelist, um, Fundi Chatsibana, who is the Deputy Governor of our Reserve Bank. And um, just a little bit of background I think is helpful here. Um, she's also a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. And before her appointment, she served as an advisor to the governor of the South African Reserve Bank and a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, Fundi is an economist with extensive experience in public policy analysis and formulation. She's worked for the National Treasury, the National Energy Regulator, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. At the IMF, she was an alternate executive director on the executive board, which runs the day-to-day -day operations of the IMF. Uh, prior to that, she was Deputy Director General at the National Treasury, where she was responsible for macroeconomic policy and economic forecasting. She did not go to NMU. However, she went to the University of KwaZulu Natal, where she has a Bachelor of Economics degree and a Master of Commerce. Um, I am equally excited because I'm a huge follower of um, a recent Nobel Prize winner, uh, Danny Kahneman, who wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And you kind of think, well, how does behavioral economics have much to do with the Reserve Bank? And I think that's what we're about to find out. So I'm really thrilled, Fundy. It's lovely meeting you. Um, I can see you, and I think we can hear you. So I'm going to take myself away, and everyone can just get you for the next uh, for the next little while. Thank you so much, and welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Russell, for for that introduction, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak at your leadership summit. When I got this invitation, I puzzled over the leadership angle from which I, I could talk based on my practical experience. Eventually, as I was thinking about the economic discussions in our country this past year, and the fact that the, the Reserve Bank is going to be uh, celebrating 100 years of existence, I thought, why not reflect on leadership lessons from a 100-year-old institution. Well, let me tell you why. Um, as a relatively new to central banking, I've been fascinated by how central banks function, uh, the magnitude of the decisions they make, and how the most important elements of their work often go unnoticed by, by many of us because these are things that are simply what ought to be. We don't think when we go to the ATM to draw cash, it's just there. We don't think when we take out our cards to make payments. Uh, we don't stop uh, to think when we make EFT transfers, unless of course there are system glitches. We don't think about how government is able to borrow money in financial markets week after week. Uh, they just do. And these are functions that are performed by, by central bank. And in the middle of the various economic crises that we've had in our country, we haven't lost sleep over many of these things because they just seem to happen. At the same time, there are many other things we are losing sleep over as South Africans. For instance, uh, we have had around 200,000 excess deaths uh, over the past one and a half years, mostly due to COVID-19. We have youth uh, sitting at around 46.3%. The largest public sector debt burden in our country. There's a lot of uncertainty about the reopening of many businesses in hospitality, travel, and tourism. And there is a high likelihood that many people and many firms will be left behind as we move into the digital age. These are things where there are huge gaps uh, between what is happening and what ought to be. And as leaders, our task is to help to close the gaps, 
yes, the starting point uh, we have in the country is very difficult. But still, the South African problem is not only that we've had a difficult history, it is that we keep on producing more of it. And our challenge as leaders today is changing this pattern, not only by developing plans, but implementing them and taking decisions to correct our course along the way. So Russell mentioned that I'm an economist, and, and as you know, economics is a subject that is obsessed with decision making. This is because the subject matter of economics is human beings and their choices, which is hard because human choices defy simple rules. So I hope my address today will give you some ideas about making better decisions based on my experiences at the South African Reserve Bank uh, and the broad economics literature. In particular, I will draw on ideas from the field of behavioral economics. My title for this address is drawn from one of the most famous books in this field, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who happens to be a psychologist. Uh, you can think a bit more about why psychologists uh, are doing uh, work in economics. But to give context to the title, the book talks about two modes of thought. System one thinking, which is fast, it's instinctive and emotional, and system two thinking, which is slower, more deliberate and logical. This book and the larger field of behavioral economics is fundamentally about human decision making and where it goes wrong. For Kinnaman, Humans make two kinds of judgment errors, bias and noise. People use decision-making shortcuts, often unconsciously, which, is, uh, which causes them to make mistakes in specific directions. This is bias. And then their judgments are surprisingly erratic, which is noise. A good example of bias is the fear of flying. So plane crashes are very rare, but when they happen, they are newsworthy. On the other hand, car crashes are very common, but they get much less attention. Unfortunately, we are biased towards treating visible and dramatic information as being more important. As for noise, even where there's no bias, there's still a surprising amount of randomness in human decisions. And in their latest book, Kenneman and his co-authors discuss large disparities in criminal sentences for basically similar cases, with some defendants getting one-year sentences and others 15 years for the same offense. They also document similar noisiness in the medical profession. Radiographers, for example, will come up with different diagnosis for um, when looking at the same x-ray. Well, the point is not that judges and medical professionals are especially untrustworthy, rather that human beings are surprisingly random. Even for experts, and even for something quite objective, like an X-ray. When I joined, before I joined the central bank, I used to make lots of jokes about central banks and their committees. I'm sure lots of you might. But I now have an appreciation of why these committees matter as decision-making structures. Most real world decision making features high levels of uncertainty and significant risk of error. This means that we must have mechanisms to bring together different perspectives and that we must rigorously interrogate evidence to minimize our personal biases and noise. 
so that decisions can be justified. And this is relevant for both public policymakers and private sector leaders. So let me talk a bit more about central banking now. When I first started exploring the work on fast and slow thinking, of course, I started with its relevance to public policy. Central banking, for example, should be a classic case of slow, deliberate thinking with a medium term view and logical evidence based analysis. When we change interest rates today, that has effects about 12 to 24 months ahead. But very often, the debate in the public domain about monetary policy is absorbed by short term thinking. It's focused on last month's data. For instance, in May this year, we got an inflation print of 5.2% which is above the 4.5% midpoint of our inflation target range. The SARB had been projecting a spike in inflation for over a year. We had published our forecasts for inflation and the implications for the interest rate path. So when the May print came out, it was basically no surprise to us at the SARB. Nonetheless, this concrete, visible data point seemed to make people think that the Saab would be more likely to hike interest rates. Similarly, in June, when inflation slowed to 4.9%, this was welcomed as good news for interest rates. But again, we had expected this, and at most it confirmed our forecasts, which I will remind everyone were public already. So these are classic examples of the so-called availability heuristic, where something easy to see obscures the facts which actually matter for a decision. And this past year, the focus on short-term issues contributed to a lot of criticism of the Saab as not doing enough to support the economy. Yet when we look at historic performance of the Saab, uh, imperfect as, as our central bank might be, uh, the Saab has kept to its price stability mandate and brought down inflation rates to well within the inflation target. The cost of borrowing is therefore lower because lenders don't have to demand so much inflation compensation. SARP decisions have also become more transparent. At every meeting of the NPC, we publish our forecasts and we give reasons for our decisions. So fairly low and stable inflation is now something we take for granted in South Africa. And high inflation is perceived as something that happens to other people far away. But if the Saab had not patiently worked on stabilizing inflation and building credibility, we could easily have been one of those high inflation countries. Then inflation would have been high on the list of the problems that I mentioned earlier worrying us all and keeping us awake. And the SARP certainly would not have been able to move fast when the COVID crisis hit and cut interest rates to, to record lows. Demonstrated with its policy response to the COVID crisis that slow thinking doesn't mean slow responses. And it certainly does not mean not taking decisions. Actually, slow, more deliberate, logical, and longer term thinking is essential for building buffers that support rapid responses during crisis and for public institutions to adapt to the evolving needs of, of the economy. I spoke about bias and noise earlier. 
to minimize our individual biases and noise, at the sub we have committee-based decision meetings where we sit down, study data, consult models to give us policy guidance. Then we argue with each other, often quite energetically. Perhaps that seems odd and unbelievable when you hear that some decisions of the NPC are, are unanimous. Maybe you think real experts don't argue and don't need help to, to make decisions. But given high levels of uncertainty and significant risks of error in decision making, it is crucial for leaders to have the confidence to test their decisions properly. You are a better leader if you accept that decision making is hard and that gut instinct is unreliable. In offering this brief sketch of decision making and how economists have studied it over the year, let me conclude with a few takeaways that I, I hope will stay with you and inform your thinking and, and leadership. The first lesson for me uh, has been that leadership is about people. People learn, they adapt their behaviors to incentives and their expectations of the future. And in the past, central bankers and other economists spent too much time trying to fit people into physics type models with unchanging laws and behaviors. Uh, we are doing much better since we've come to rely on communication and credibility as key mechanisms of achieving our goals and recognize it that people adapt to conditions, people respond better to being led where they understand where they are going and why they are going there. The second lesson is that once longer term objectives have been set, we should have the discipline to stick to them. This doesn't mean we ignore where we are or what is happening in front of our eyes because starting points do matter. But there is a big difference between course correction and changing strategy. So as a country, we need to make decisions and take deliberate actions that steadily move us in the direction of what we set out in our long-term strategy, the National Development Plan. The NDP vision for the country includes, among others, in an inclusive economy with high employment, high investment, a low cost of living, a lower cost of doing business, and better education outcomes. There are no shortcuts to these outcomes. And as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. But the second best time is now. We all wish better decisions had been made historically. But the question for leaders is, what good decisions are we making right now? The third lesson is that the lived experience of being a leader is confusing, it's loud, and it's uncertain. We all cope as best as we can, but some coping mechanisms make things worse. So as leaders, we therefore need to work hard to manage our biases and our knee-jerk reactions. Thus, it is vital to have sound mechanisms, different perspectives that minimize bias and noise and decision making, and which end with a clear decision. As leaders, we must have humility and accept that finding answers is not easy, but we can design the best processes we can to get to good decisions and then have the courage to commit and deliver. The fourth lesson uh, I draw from, from central banking uh, is that as we contemplate our challenges as institutions, as businesses, as a country, 
we must remember we can't do everything. We can't do it all. And we will fail if we try. One of the things that the behaviorists got right was to recognize that complexity can be overwhelming and that real world decision making requires coping mechanisms. From the perspective of a country, one of the ways you do this is by having institutions that accumulate expertise and specialize in specific decisions. Then you must let them do their jobs. The Saab has been given mandates to protect price stability, protect and enhance financial stability. These are clear missions. These are important missions uh, that support the functioning of the economy assigned to us by a democratic constitutional order. And we have therefore focused on them. We have avoided interfering in other areas where we don't have expertise and where we could put our main goals at risk. This focus has helped us to deliver substantial benefits to South Africa. So let me conclude by saying that the broad lesson for me is that as leaders, we must recognize we can't fix everything. It, it's just too much. We have to divide up the work and then we have to each focus on the things that we can do best. I hope these ideas will be useful to you and I'll be happy to take questions during our panel discussion. Thank you and back to you, Russell. As I come off mute, Funny, that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as we get ready to bring um, our, uh, Johan and uh, pa well, panelists back generally, a uh, quick question that I want to ask you, and somebody asked this, uh, Charmaine asked this in the chat while you were speaking, and I think it was about the availability heuristic you, you, you talked about. Um, and she, her comment was, something that's easy to see but obscures the real problem. Could you explain that again? So I don't know if you remember what that was, um, because well, I think it was fairly yes. early. Okay, great. If you wouldn't mind yes. putting just sharing sharing response to that. Yeah. So I I think what I'm trying to allude to here is that there are many things that we're going to come across as leaders uh, that can obscure what is important. So we need to distinguish what is urgent but not important. But what is urgent and important? That, that's what, what the concept of availability heuristic is. And often we will see information in front of us. So there's a child crying in the other room and there's fire in the kitchen in front of me. So I want to put out this fire. So do I put out this fire or do I go and check while, is, while the child is crying? And, and mothers will identify with this quite... Uh, quite quite readily. For us as the central bank, and, and that's the context that I, I was putting to here, is that we are often asked, well, inflation is this low today, it's very low today. So why are you uh, why are you cut, why are you hiking interest rates? Because inflation is low right now. And and the point for us is that actually inflation today does not matter for the decision we have to make. Because if we cut interest rates today, the impact already only starts to be felt in 12 months time. So the information that is important for our decision is what is going to happen to inflation in 12 months time, not where inflation is today. So that's the concept of, of the availability uh, heuristic have to understand at all times as a leader, what is the decision that I have to make over what time horizon? And don't get distracted uh, by the things that are around you. It's not to say that you ignore them, no. And, and that's why I was talking about the fact that starting points matter. So in South Africa right now, we have the level of unemployment that we have. But when we are making decisions, our decisions take time to kick in. So we are making a decision today uh, that will either 
how to increase the investment of the firm or make a decision today on how we are going to lower the unemployment rate in 12 months time or yeah. in four years time so so that that's the point that that i want to illustrate with that thanks Wendy, thank you so much. That was that was great, and hopefully, um, hopefully, it gave some gave some clarity to the question that you had um, you would posed there, Charmaine. As we bring um, bring Sean and Johan back on, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the intersection here of um, of, of the role that the Fed, the the the, the, Fed, the South African Reserve Bank plays from a federal point of view. Um, as a not quite a government institution, but not a private institution, and also the, the role of private industry as well. Um, let me put a question to all of you uh, to kick us off, and I want to take the theme from Fundi's uh, presentation for a minute. The idea that we, and this is your third lesson that you gave us, Fundi, right? as leaders, we need to manage our biases. We need to be very aware of those. So quick question, it's a personal, you know, not a personal question, but a professional question. Um, but how do you as a leader manage your biases? What do you do? How do you become aware of them? Um, maybe just reflect on that and give us a quick response if you wouldn't mind each of you to get us going this morning and Fundy, since you were talking about it why don't i start with you and then we'll go to sean and then we'll go to uh Yahan. yeah so so my my coping mechanism and, and how i manage biases is one i i read widely i talk to people across uh all 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 spheres um uh it's, it's quite important, and I learned this when I first joined the public service. So I joined the public service. I'm a public policy maker, and I'm advising on what activities and actions to be done uh, to support business. I've never run a business in my life. <laughs> so quite important for me to engage with people who have run businesses, different sizes of businesses. So I think just uh, having interactions with different people is useful to me. I consult a lot with people who have gone through certain things. So I'm new to central banking. I, I talk to central bankers uh, in many different countries. And I one of the things I learned when I was at the IMF as well, is that, well, you sit in a South African central bank and there are things that you've never dealt with. There are other entities on the continent that deal with bigger problems that you've never dealt with. So very useful to talk uh, with those people as well. Uh, and as a leader of people as well, because I'm also a manager, uh, I also spend a lot of time talking to my people so and, and understanding where they come from. So this culture of debate is very important for me. Debate with people, even with people that I disagree with, because I need to understand those different perspectives I need to understand where they come from because I don't have full information. And that also includes using my husband, my kids, everyone in my family as sounding boards for different ideas that I have. And, and that's been quite useful for me in managing my biases because I've been trained to think in a certain way as an economist, but very useful to, to hear from people who think differently from you who live differently from the way that you do, because these are important trade-offs to consider. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sean, what would you add to that um, or, or do differently? I think it's very much the same, Russell. You know, biasness is something that we have to manage on, on a daily basis. From an engineering perspective, there's always the right way of doing things. From a manufacturing perspective, there's always only one way of doing things. but that changes dramatically when you work with people you know and uh, it, you've got to get to a point where you have to solicit opinions you have to solicit, solicit different views from your team and that's how we build a diverse and inclusive work environment you know so soliciting opinions and views from from the team puts us on a different path where we try different things. There, there's a, a, a typical view that goes, if you do what you always did, you'll get what you always got. You have to look at things differently. You have to try different views. And that's my view on it. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Sean. Johan, um, how do well, you manage by it? I, 
think that's a big well. You know, I think a lot of people misunderstand my role. They think that I, I run a business uh, investing people's money or uh, advising on strategy on the basis that I think I know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and that's not what you do as an investor. The, the whole idea is know what's going to happen in the future. And one way to, to keep that humility, um, <clears throat> you're a fan of Daddy Kahneman. Uh, he speaks not only of, <coughs> excuse me, fast and slow, but I think it was, um, he also came up with a notion of cognitive dissonance, or at least developed the theme uh, very strongly. Cognitive dissonance being the reaction that your mind has when it comes across evidence that is contradictory to your previous bias. Right, so you, you see something and you go, no, that's got to be wrong because I believe something else. <laughs> and it's, it's, I, I found, certainly when I was younger and a lot more arrogant, I hadn't made so many mistakes. Um, you, you, you make a few errors of judgment, you know, you do the wrong thing. And then you have to start to, to develop a mindset of almost like a feedback loop of your own decision making. Right, so what did I do? Um, you can, obviously, you can often have outcomes that don't pan the way you want it, but you made the right decision. If you go back in time and you look at what the variables were you were looking at, and you can convince yourself that at the time, that was the best decision to make, but other stuff happened. You know, that's how life goes. But you have to be open to uh, that recognition that your own cognitive dissonance uh, is going to take you. That might be your perception of certain relationships. It might be to do with how you perceive people's reaction to the way you manage them. It might be how people react to how you manage the business. You might have a specific view of things, they might not, and that sort of reality clash, that's the dissonance mm -hmm. that you manage. My suggestion would be to almost formally build that sort of feedback loop into your decision-making process and ask the questions afterwards and learn what you can. Yeah. And you've also said, you know, that's, that's the way I try to play it. There, there are some um, pretty powerful, uh, for our audience as well, some pretty powerful um, yeah, strategies that you can go through, uh, techniques and so on that you can employ, just just being mindful of um, of decisions that you've made, uh, being mindful as you do a retrospective or a post-mortem. And there's also an interesting exercise called a pre-mortem, which is to sit down at the beginning of something and anticipate why it may fail to try and make sure that you don't make mistakes in execution or in judgment um, as you go through that. Uh, we are mindful, of course, that we've um, we've lost Fundi and hopefully she'll be able to join us, rejoin us uh, back on the panel. Um, but Sean, an interesting question came in and just a reminder to everybody, please use the Q&A function and use the chat function uh, to post any questions that you might have for any of our panelists or all of our panelists. Um, uh, one of our attendees named Rachmacht has has asked a question, Sean, I actually think it's a pretty good one, um, not to imply that others aren't. But he said, with respect to disruptive innovation uh, and continuous changes that are happening within the business and the manufacturing environment, how do you manage that and how do you accommodate that within a turnaround strategy of a distressed business? So how, how, how do you turn around a business whilst also perhaps trying to embrace not just the idea of innovation, but disruptive innovation, something that's actually going to move you move you forward. Okay, no, that's that's one of the key elements within automotive. Uh, uh, we've got a, um, a thought process that goes by how do you disrupt yourself differently every day? What are we going to do differently every single day that is not standard practice within the automotive industry? Um, we've got to come to work every single day and not just look at the processes that we run as standard practice. We have to ask ourselves, okay, but what are we producing today in total relative to work content? So that work content that you're producing for today, how many minutes, hours is that equated to? What is the total amount of headcount that you have and that total amount of available hours, how does that two compare? In no manufacturing organization, is your total work content that you produce equal, equivalent to the total amount of hours that you're actually putting into the business? In other words, your manpower. You're always, always paying more than what you're producing, which means inevitably you've got more time available within the business. So you've got to dive deep into the business and say to yourself, but hey, I'm only loaded at 80% of the day. 
I'm only loaded at 85% of the week. I have 15% available for disruptions. How do I get the 15% available? How do I make that available for our people? How do I take capacity out of the business and assign that to disruptions? That's terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, and welcome back, Fundi. I know, you know, the good news is that in, the, in an era of uh, incredible uh, cyber uh, security and you, you've seen all the ransomware that's been going out, um, we, are, we are very fortunate in that the South African Reserve Bank is uh, touch wood, uh, very secure. And, uh, and so we need to make sure that we've got all of our firewalls in place. So, Fundi, it's great to have you back. Thank you. Um, Here's a question that came that came across from Anita Palmer, and she asks, uh, how does one avoid groupthink, particularly in a committee decision making, if you have, uh, and this is for anyone, um, if you have an autocratic leader, so that's one attribute of this leader, who is, who is not self-aware, so that's the second attribute of this leader, autocratic and not self-aware. Um, how do you avoid groupthink in those cases? And anyone or, or all of you who'd like to add something to that? Why don't we start? Johan, what would you start with on that one? Well, I've just, uh, I've actually, <laughs> putting me on the spot, because I've just gone privately back to Anita and sort of wrote her a little response. Um, and I'll quote it anyway. Um, I, I have found occasionally anyway, uh, the, best, the best solution is walk away. Um, you, know, it, you know, find another one, find another job. I, I understand that's a bit of a comment because often enough that's uh, that's not an option, right? Uh, it's for, for various reasons, you can't just like you know throw out your throw your toys out of the pram. Um, um, and in in middle management, it comes up um, far more frequently than people are likely to admit. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the the best solution there um, that person who's uh, autocratic uh, and not self-aware. It doesn't sound to me like it's a leader. It sounds to me like that's a person that's been appointed into a position. And what you typically find, what I have found often enough, is that the real leaders will take charge anyway. The way that you find the real leader is not a person who's been appointed into a position. It's, it's, the, it's the guy or girl who gets stuff done, and when they turn around, they see everybody's behind them, uh, following their example. And in that kind of environment, that's probably the best way to, to actually find the natural leaders in that situation uh, and try to make a difference and get the get the stuff done, um, building coalition and the able. Uh, because someone that's running a, a team um, who's not really the leader, uh, that, that causes, you know, again, massive amount of dissonance and stress. I would suggest that's sort of the one flippant response and one a little bit more concrete. All right, thanks, Johan. Um, Fundi, Sean? Yeah, I'm happy to, to come in. So, look, I, I'm not scared to, to poke, uh, even when there's an, an autocratic leader. Uh, look, and, and I think here one has to think about approaches that one has. So, uh, in some instances, you don't have the option to quit. And, and I, was, uh, I was brought up... Uh, in the treasury and and my when i was growing up because we were all young working at the treasury uh, and we used to joke around and say oh we're being brought up in the west because we had a very strong leader growing up and he used to challenge us and ask us questions so i i learned quite early on not to be shy to express my views because minority views still matter and and i think that also challenging autocratic leaders by making them account so that they are also visible to themselves. Uh, and as Johan mentions, there are many different opportunities to lead. You can lead uh, as a follower as well, uh, because there are different types of, of leadership. You can lead uh, when you are in middle management uh, as well. So I, I think that for me, uh, there are different approaches to how you lead. You can lead with a soft approach, you can lead with a hard approach. You need to be adaptive in your leadership style because the conditions vary across organizations. Uh, I'm a servant, so uh, servant leadership is a big issue. My phone is misbehaving today. So servant leadership is, uh, is a big issue uh, for me and, and I'm in service. Uh, I'm not the president. 
I'm doing work that is in service of the country. And that is the leadership style that is required for me to be a public servant. Because what I'm doing is not about me, it's about the country. I'm not running my, my own business. So I, I think it's quite important to be adaptive to your leadership style, to question things, and to be comfortable at the end of the day with the decisions that you're making. Because it is quite important to also lead yourself. So you need to understand why am I here? What am I looking to achieve? So as a leader myself, I'm not shy actually to hire people who are smarter than I am. Because that is what challenges you, that pushes you to, to mm -hmm. the next level. So if you are a good leader, you should actually be hiring people who are a lot better than you, who are a lot smarter than you, uh, and know how to utilize those skills and, and how to lean on those people. And, and that takes me back to what we were talking about earlier, about understanding different points of views uh, and, and consulting Marky as well. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks for that. Sean, uh, any responses? I, you know, I have to agree with, um, with both, both speakers. Um, from an automotive perspective, um, it's always been, or the, the, the thought process has always been previously, you drive the business, you drive with autocratic um, management styles. And, and I have to tell you, that has changed dramatically. You cannot, you cannot manage in that type of environment anymore. You know, so it's got to be an inclusive environment where you serve your people, your leadership team, is the servants of your employees on the floor. I know it sounds, it sounds somewhat crazy, but our responsibility is not just to drive change, but to create a culture in the environment that drives change. The only way we do that is by getting inclusive behavior. Fantastic. Appreciate that. Well, you know, so, so, the, so the art of a leader um, and in, in pursuing the art and the science of a leader in pursuing their role is really, really critical. Um, I, I want to focus for probably our last little theme here on the idea of hope, right? Because the conference talks about from global grief to hope. And we had the Black Swan event of COVID. Um, we, we've had, obviously, the, the terrible looting um, recently in South Africa, as that, as that has had an effect. Um, as, you, as you look forward, whether it's from all of your different vantage points that you have, um, Perhaps I'm going to ask you just extemporaneously to share a minute or two of your thoughts around what gives you hope personally? What gives you hope as you look around, um, you know, driving to work or popping online to your, your Zoom calls every day? Um, what, what, what gives you hope? Um, and, and how are you working with, with the people that work with you every day to, to instill that hope and, and realize some of that hope? Um, Johan, I'm going to start with you. Um, and I know that you're obviously had a very unique experience. And if you want to share some of what it's been like to be locked down in, in Singapore, um, because maybe not everybody appreciates just what that has felt like, um, but maybe you start there and then we'll, then we'll go to Fundy and then Sean. Yeah, look, that's a, that's a highly personalized question and I, I'll, um, I won't shirk the answer because I think, you know, we, we, we're sharing here and we, we're among friends that we trust. Um, it, it's been a long, long time since we've uh, been able to even leave the house without a mask. I think it's 18 months. Um, I have a 25 year old daughter who I've not seen in 20 months uh, because I don't even know if I can come back to Singapore once I've left the country because of the travel restrictions. Um, the secret to, for me, in a very micro way, um, is to try to, to, to cling to those things and normal. So what's, what is that is human interaction is absolutely critical. So whether it's on a Zoom or you know, in this format or whatever you do, be absolutely sure that you keep talking to people. Make sure that you don't fall into the trap of uh, you know, luring yourself into that self-confinement uh, that you are going to be in. Now, I don't know to what extent this applies to other folks on the call, but that's like a key, key thing. Again, it's like probably also to steer yourself away from that the sort of cognitive uh, trap that you can fall into. You just like become too sort mm -hmm. of you know ensconced in your own world. And then I think the other things that that give me a lot of hope is when you look around the world and how you know some governments have responded, um, what's going on in our own country and so forth, is 
there are some people who have naturally um, in South Africa and elsewhere <clears throat> have taken the lead that give you hope for humanity that give you just the you know the let's say the, the faith months from today you will be back to where you were before and that life will go on and that you will actually survive you know whatever travails that have come your way now I face a lot of first world problems right I'm talking about travel and so forth I don't have an income problem I have a job I've started my own business you know so I'm from that point of view a lot of other people face tremendous existential issues across the world and again looking at them and how they face down those issues and how they stand up and survive that has to give you hope for humanity you know, they don't lie down. You look at, say, you know, I actually have personal friends uh, who lost their entire livelihood in the Lebanese bomb. You remember that thing that happened in the Lebanese harbor uh, when the, the whole of, like, Beirut basically went up in, in smoke. And um, these were people, lawyers, tax accountants, and management consultants. And they had their wealth tied up in, in, uh, in a property there, it, it, like, in a second. And Brazilians of these folks. I think let's stop at that. It's like look at other people that are doing things that you wish that you could have done, that other people can see that that have made you proud to be said, look, this is the this is the courage I'm showing. Keep that going. To focus too much on the, you know, the things that are happening inside of your own you like expand that exposure. Thank you, Johan, for for um for being personal and, and your candor, I certainly didn't uh, expect you to go there, but I, I, I think everybody appreciates that you did. So thank you. Um, Fundi. Yeah. So what, what gives me hope at this point in time is, you know, how we have realized what matters. So I think there's, there's not uh, who hasn't had to cut through the fluff, <laughs> whether it's within organizations or within our families, we've had to uh, identify what matters, what are our values, what do we want to be uh, going forward? And, and that is what, what gives me hope because I think it's going to give us an excellent balancing board uh, going forward. I think that also just looking at public sector institutions more broadly, we we found out for the first time what a lot of institutions do because we've had to get back to basics. What is the service offering that we all have to provide? What is it that we should be doing? And, and I think that for me, that's very important uh, for, for a country. Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Johan about the importance of human con uh, connections. And this is one of the things that matters that we have all realized about how we connect, uh, how often we connect and, and the importance of that, because it's something that we've come to, to take for granted. What makes me especially hopeful is the adaptive behaviors that we have seen among ourselves uh, in the way that we do business, in the way that we, we've interacted with each other. We haven't become defeated by, by the we also uh, rose to the occasion in terms of out. I mean, if we look over the past year at contributions to the Solidarity Fund, forget the corporate contributions, but things that individuals were doing out of their own uh, pockets to help each other. Uh, we've seen with the recent riots how communities have stood together. So for me, these are things that, that are quite important. And of course, being South African, uh, we always have jokes. We haven't lost our humor, uh, which I think is, is something that, that holds us in, in good stead. So uh, that's another element that, that, uh, that gives me hope that we haven't lost who we are in South Africa. Thank you, Fundi. You talk about the sense of humor. One of the most um, subscribed to courses at, at um, I think it's through Udemy, but it's one of the online platforms um, offered by Yale University is how to be happy. And, um, and a strong theme within that course. And I, when I say one of the most well attended, I mean, millions of people around the world have, have taken this course. And I think you can take it for free or you know, pay a little bit and you get a certificate. Um, but humor is a key part of, of, of just how to be happy. Um, so I'm glad, you, I'm glad you talked about that because we aren't living in times that one would naturally think of is, uh, is something to, um, to find a sense of humor about. Sean, let me let you respond. And then I'm certainly going to 
uh, give you a, a thought of my own as well. But Sean. You know, as, as South Africans, we are absolutely resilient. And, um, you know, tying back to what Finis just mentioned now, if you look at all the lootings, the writing and so forth, you know, one, one tends to lose hope. But there's a lot of stories that have come out of there where you, you actually get a lot of hope out of people that have been through so terrible things. They have hope. They want to move on. And you look at the small little problems that you have, you just cannot compare it to people that are positive and want to move on. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's from a, from a South African perspective. Personally, for me, I walk every single day into the plant, every single day. I spend about 80% of my day on the production floor with the operators, with my team. And I can tell you without any form of hesitation, my operators on the floor give me hope every single day. They come to work every single day, whether it's raining, hailing, sunshine, they come in to perform a day's activity. And if you look at the rate of pay that they receive relative to the amount of work they put in, it's tough, but they are happy. And my hope is every day that I ensure that my people have work in the plant that I bring volume into this company and I keep my people employed. That for me drives hope every single day. Um, you know, I, I almost feel that that is, that's the perfect way for us to, uh, to bring this to a close. You know, I think um, similar to what you've all said, when you look at the remarkable resilience that we've been able to, uh, to demonstrate as as a, as a species, we've gone through something that has shifted our worlds um, from, you know, we're social beings, we were forced inside, we were forced to wear masks, we are forced to social distance. Um, and I, I think as you look around and you realize that we've been able to do that, and uh, and 18 months, almost 18 months in now, um, we, we just buckle up and we keep at it. We figure out what the answer needs to be. Um, and, and, and through all of that, we've, we've tried to get better. Um, and not everything's worked and we figure that out and we acknowledge that. Um, but the idea that we, we are adaptive uh, and that we can change, I think is probably one of the greatest signals of, of hope. And, and you do see signs to your point of, um, of, of companies that are, that are stepping into a, into a space where, where, where its space needs to be filled. Um, supporting employees, supporting customers, um, extending payment terms, whatever it is that happens in a corporate sector. Um, parents being mindful of children. Children uh, children are having an experience growing up that we never had. Um, we used to go out and play with each other, you know, as, uh, you know run outside. Uh, kids today are on their phones because they can't go outside. What's that going to do long term? I don't know. 20 years from now, I'd be curious from a a forward-looking perspective, what our you know, economists and sociologists and development professionals are thinking about, because you know, could that could that have a profound impact on us? I don't know. Um, but I have a tremendous amount of hope equally. There was a question that was asked, and we're not going to get to it now, but the question was, are we doing enough? Are companies doing enough? I don't think it's only companies' responsibility, um, but are companies doing enough to cultivate great leaders? And I think um, one of the key themes out of the, the, the whole two days, but certainly this uh, this morning, has been the role that leaders play in creating an environment for people to thrive, uh, to learn and to adapt and to grow. Uh, so we're not going to be able to dive into that, Brett. Uh, thank you very much for your question, though. And I think that there's um, there's always work to be done between creating leaders versus just appointing people to a role. Um, I, I want to thank our all of our speakers this morning. Um, in order of their, their speeches, uh, Johan, uh, thank you for joining us from Singapore and sharing with us the data, as well as the hope and the aspiration um, around what can be done and some strategies yeah, for, for uh, policymakers to get out of the way and let small businesses thrive, uh, all the way through to investing in education. That'll have a long-term effect because just as Fundy said, you know, if you didn't plant a tree 30 years ago, start planting today. Right? Um, Sean, you shared some fantastic insights on distressed businesses, but equally just sort of understanding value add from the value chain point of view and understanding what is valuable. Um, and I think if we can get back to understanding that and focusing on how value gets created, we probably will get out of the way in a lot of cases and, and add value. 
Um, Fundy, the comments, and I don't know if you all see them, have been terrific around all of the speeches, but around your triggering of us thinking about um, biases and how we work and, and um, you know, the introduction of, of, uh, of fast and slow and the perspective from psychology um, is probably not what people expected from uh, the deputy director or the deputy governor of the, the Reserve Bank. So um, that was a wonderful twist and I appreciate all of you being on with us today. So with that, I want to thank you all. If you wouldn't mind um, turning your, your phones on or your cameras off and, and turning on to mute. Um, I'm sure lots of people are going to reach out to you separately to get um, to follow up this conversation. So I appreciate you being here. Um, what I will also say before I get ready to hand over to um, our, our person will wrap it up for us today is that all of the content is going to be available online after the session. The sessions have been recorded. Uh, you will get uh, communication from um, uh, NMU to let you know how to access that. I'm not entirely sure how it'll work now, but it'll be done through the portal, uh, through the business school portal, and you'll be able to access this for a period of time. And I encourage you to do that. Potentially play these with uh, with, with with teams in your in your in your office, um, your significant others at home, whomever you think might be interested. Let's share the share the value that you've been able to obtain. Um, I'm really excited now to introduce uh, the person who kind of wrap up our, our conversation for this morning, Dr. Randall Jonas. Now, Dr. Randall Jonas is uh, the director of our, our business school at NMU. Um, he has, he's the chairperson of the National uh, Association of Business Schools in South Africa and a former CEO and current director of, of a number of different companies. Um, he studied at different universities, his bachelor's, his honors, and his master's degree, and he completed his PhD at NMU, so he's also an alum. Um, started his career in education several years ago and has held a number of leadership positions uh, at the different institutions where he has worked. Uh, he started in uh, tertiary education, received a national leadership award for outstanding contribution to the sector. Uh, he has played, uh, Randall, and I've got to know over the past probably 18 months to two years, I think it is. And it's been a wonderful experience working together, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, working in strategic management, best practices and corporate governance in, in organizations, which I think we can all agree is really, really important. Um, having the right amount of corporate governance, not too much, but equally making sure that there's some oversight. Um, he understands the organizational dynamics of, of a team, uh, understands the, the, the the philosophy that drives uh, that drives individuals and his own philosophy, um, it, it, he's driven by his own personal philosophy on what uh, on what motivates people and how to get them to 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 uh, to perform really really well. Um, a, a well well versed speaker has spoken a number of times at various conferences. Just a, a wonderful professional uh, who I'm pleased to say I get to spend some time with every once in a while. Uh, not enough, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing you again in person. So, Dr. Jones, with that, I'm going to leave the stage, and I'm going to leave you to, um, to take us into the next little session. Thank you very much, uh, Russell, for that uh, introduction. Um, and thank you very much once again to our speakers for gracing us with their presence of over the two days and for giving us some wonderful insights, you know, that really helps us to reawaken the, the human spirit in our theory of change that we are trying to achieve in our country. I want to also thank my colleagues that made it possible for, for us to, to, to have the summer today. But Russell, to you, thank you so much for actually doing a brilliant job. My, my purpose really today is actually just to, to wrap up the, the discussions we had, and I hope that I can keep you um, uh, sitting uh, at your chairs watching this uh, summit whilst we do this. We had a, a number of speakers with different themes, but it all comes down to, I think, what I said at the beginning, uh, at the opening of the summit yesterday, that um, Rosameth Moskanter identified five ifs for, as the key to success. And I found in my summaries, I've written about 10 pages. Yes, I've written them of the summaries of all the speakers and I had to rush because uh, the deputy governor just finished hers. Uh, and um, I worked through it whilst I was listening to the Q&A and try to pick out the main themes that came from that. And I can assure you the theme that permeates all the speakers is certainly one, our theory of change that puts people at the center of transformation and reform and prosperity. It seems as if there was a caucus among these speakers to say, let us talk about how important it is to center people in everything that we do on the factory floor, in the board chamber, wherever we go, 
people at the center of it. And I think that those, those themes that came out actually defines the art and science of leadership as, as, as Russell has mentioned. And the message of hope came through quite strongly, quite so strongly that I think when you look at the chat boxes, people were pushed to, 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 to ask more questions and make more contributions. And if you collate all of these thoughts, you find that the narrative is clearly one of awakening our humanity once again amidst the 4IR, amidst the unrest, amidst COVID, amidst, amidst world, uh, 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 a turbulent world and, and a changing world as such, where there is a story of hope, there is a narrative moving from that grief of COVID-19 to hope once again. And I think for, for me, just to take out, for example, out of our very first speaker, Mr. Isaac Mflanga, the chief economist from Alexander Forbes, one of the things that I thought speaks to the theme for me, he said many things, and those are technical details, but to me, the, the, the jewel was when he spoke about what are the components of an inclusive and a sustainable economy and a growth strategy for the, for, your, for the country. And he spoke about the new social compact. And interestingly, Dr. Lou, uh, Dr. Foster also spoke about that compact that is, in, that, is, that is needed. And that compact is necessary for impact. And I think it, impact was well-defined by Dr. Johan Juster. Uh, I, I just promoted him to a doctor now when he spoke about uh, what it means to have impact. So again, coming out of, of, of uh, Isar's uh, discussion comes the whole idea of stronger and sustainable institutions. Our country needs it most because of the corruption that we've seen and because of the, the struggles that we have in getting government's uh, uh, initiatives to really impact people, so to speak. And then, of course, lastly, he spoke about South African needing quicker reforms, quicker and faster. And again, it comes to, he also used the, 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 the he also spoke about the slow vaccination process, but certainly, uh, um, fully, I don't think it's that kind of slow that the Reserve Bank embraces, is the different kind of slow that he was referring to because he cited it as a huge risk to economic recovery. Yohanda Nation was a jewel again. He spoke about storm proofing the business. And there he said, you needed to be leader and be better equipped. But he also celebrated leadership in stating this world and many, many companies today needs bold and courageous leadership. He said, we're living in a very, very complex world, but you need different perspectives. And again, that came out from the talk from Sean, as well as from, as from Fundi. And of course, I think Johan also decried, decried the idea that, that we have a displacement of labor by mechanization and of course automation. But what is needed is the recalibration of skills. And the HEI sector, the higher education institution sector, is that sector that has to play an important role in that recalibration of skills. And I think that is where the whole idea of civil society comes in, the whole stakeholder capitalism comes in, and of course, the role that business schools play in changing the narrative of business and that business is for good and changing the narrative to stakeholder capitalism more than anything else. Because today, more than ever, we need community activism. And that was the theme coming from Dr. Foster again, because he spoke about the, the, the leadership at the community level needs to see and hear the people they serve. You need to see and hear the people that you serve. And that transformation is people-centered. She also spoke about local leadership and, of course, collective intelligence and the role of civil society in, in changing the world that you want. The business school and university motto is lead the change, change the world. In other words, this is what we are trying to do to bring about impact uh, in, into our world. And, of course, Johan Neuster spoke about the need for focused and fast reforms. He mentioned the, the big risk of having the sustained high levels of unemployment that is a huge risk to our country. And he mentioned the, 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 the conundrum is that we're having a growing population, but we need to find another solution for the jobs problem. And that is economic growth that is very, very strong. And of course, he also referred to structural changes and structural unemployment, citing, of course, our poor performance in the HDI index, you know, with other countries of the BRICS uh, uh, conglomerate, uh, Brazil and India and China, we and Russia, we are the lowest as far as that is concerned, and yet we are a BRICS member. And of course, um, Johan, again, in his definition of impact, emphasizes that, 
although it's a fashionable term, it is still a positive benefit that accrues to people. And I think that is the key thing about this. The last point we made that I wanted to emphasize this is, of course, that in government, it is important to understand that, that it's not the, the quantity of the spend, but the quality of the spend. And that requires certain efficiencies. A very, very good lesson, again, for us to take forward. And then, of course, you also ad identified the role of business, leading uh, business to be very, very, uh, uh, to understand the important work of ESG, environmental, social governance, those two, three words, ESG, and also to have, uh, to understand the community as a stakeholder. Mr. Sean Governor from Ford Motor Company, of course, also spoke a lot about the distressed companies and what needs to be done in terms of, of, of the turnaround. And I found very, very interesting use four quadrants to look at the signs of a distressed business and i think it's a lesson for us that are in business and in leadership positions to understand this the, these four quadrants he spoke about capital and liquidity then he spoke about the financial part the profitability part and then employees again coming back to our theme of of people and sean your your your, your whole philosophy i think is 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 is, is clearly focused on on, on people and then you you actually identify three components of lead, of change leadership is one the second one is culture and then strategy so again the kind of of, of themes that come through has been very very rewarding and a sort of uh, embedding the 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 centering of people in our leadership then of course fundi our last speaker thank you very much deputy governor for that very very insightful um thinking and relating it to the idea of central banking fast and slow you spent a lot of time on decision making and you brought to us home the idea of the two modes of thinking fast and slow and i was reminded when i listened to that you know about what they call con uh, conversational intelligence and he spoke about the six brains and how they have the uh, amygdala hijack uh, that is that happens to a person in 0, 0,7 seconds where you either you, you you get angry or you flee or you are frightened or you have fear and I think uh, it has got a lot to do. How do we process these things in our minds? What is our neural response? And here again, you are saying to us that in terms of, of judgment, we need to take a long term view. And that is what the role of the Reserve Bank is because of impact. And of course, in judgment, you said to make two judgment errors. You said it's bias and it's, of course, noise. And you, of course, posited the position central bank needs to have a look at long term, slow thinking. And then, of course, <clears throat> In terms of role, the role of SARPs in the economy, you celebrated the idea that it should ensure price stability. Uh, that is its mandate, and of course, also bring down inflation, which in our country, I think, heads off to you, you are doing very, very well. And I don't hope that the 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 uh, the speculations and projections, and I'm calling on Johan here, that we are seeing in the in in economic uh, circles nowadays that there's a crash coming in the United States, and that this crash will be will be worse than the Great Depression. And some people say that it is typical of a black swan event, that there will be economic prosperity for a short time. And then after that comes this huge crash. We don't hope that it's going to work. It's going to happen because certainly we want to maintain good quality of life for all our citizens all over the world. <clears throat> and then I think just to lastly, you notified us of an error, trying to put people into models. I think if you want to be people centered, don't try to fit them into your models. And that is a very, very good jewel that you're sharing with us today in terms of leadership intelligence. So without much further ado, uh, uh, um, Russell, I think it's important for me just to emphasize once again, you know, that this was one of those leadership summits that really gives a person hope. I've spent the two days sitting here listening to our speakers and really being emboldened by their passion for progress for prosperity for all the people, thinking about the many and not just the few. And I think even our participants, our delegates, they have been so active and they've been actually activists in also putting up opinions about what needs to happen to make this country work for all its people. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna hand over back to Russell, who will then introduce the president and chairman of the Mix Foundation, Mr. Mohammed, to say a few words of thanks. Thank you very much and goodbye. Sorry. Fantastic. Thank you very much again. Appreciate that. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that there's a, a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of insights that we we're able to gain over the past 
a uh, couple of days and um, and just yeah, there, there's so much there's so much that we can uh, that we can learn uh, collectively uh, really ac uh, across the um, across the board. Um, I'd like to uh, kind of take a moment now to get ready to introduce um, our last speaker, uh, who's going to just close us out a little bit this morning. Um, I am, am having a little bit of technical issues, so give me one, one moment uh, on my end while I just try and sort something out here, because it's about to pause on me, I'm afraid. Uh, if it's going to come back up, I don't know if it is now. Apologies. Okay, there we've got it. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you can uh, you can see me. All right. Well, Mr. Mr. Muhammad, who we spoke about yesterday, who closed us out yesterday, um, thrilled that we're able to uh, have you up on screen again. Um, one of the things that we emphasized yesterday was just the considerable experience that, uh, that Mr. Muhammad has in spending all of the time working with uh, with various institutions, but. I think the thing that I want to highlight again from yesterday is the 34-year un unbroken, continuous period of work being involved with this institution, um, starting with the old PE Tech and then Vista University and then Nelson Mandela University uh, Council. I mean, if one thinks about it, ultimately, and this is an element of hope as well, the amount of time and commitment that we're prepared to put into something um, is a demonstration of, of just how sincere and, and uh, uh, how much we believe in it. And I think that's, uh, that's just a tremendous indication um, and an inspiration, frankly, for me, uh, Ahmad, in, in terms of when I look at what you've been able to do, I kind of challenge myself to go, right, can I, will I be able to say in, in a couple of years' time that I spent 34 years doing something to, to benefit someone other than myself or my family? Um, and I hope, that I, I hope that I absolutely will. Um, you have a lot of experience uh, covering various disciplines at an executive management level. So you, you, you bring a context that is well-rounded. Um, I think you probably would have had an interesting perspective listening to uh, the Reserve Bank, listening to policymakers, listening to economists, and then listening to people in the business over the past two days. And I think we tried to round that out quite well. Um, you're an executive direct, non-executive director, I should say, of two automotive companies, uh, an event management company, and you chair the board of the East Cape Training Center, as well as a number of different funds, including the foundation. So with that, I'm going to take myself off and, uh, and hand straight back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Russell. Uh, ending the two days, I just wish to express uh, gratitude for the three speakers today. You are Sean Mkundu. You certainly did the uh, summit proud with your very insightful presentations. Also, I need to express great thanks to our facilitator, Russell, over the two days. You really uh, took charge of the event and uh, your performance was sterling and it's highly appreciated. Our sponsor, Engeli Enterprise Development, for your continued support for the Leadership Summit. It is highly valued and we hope that you derive uh, equal satisfaction uh, out of being part of the event. To Mux Foundation's partners, the Nelson Mandela University Business School, Randall, to you and your team, thank you very much. Our media partners, Arena Holdings, Verna and team, we value your support. To our virtual platform partner, Event Options, Lana and team, highly valued. To all participants over the two days, I hope and trust that you derive great value from uh, listening to our speakers over the past two days. Your active participation, uh, judging by the chat and the question and answer uh, sections, uh, is highly valued and uh, you contributed enormously. As I close the summit, I apologize, we ran a little bit over time, but I close the 2021 Leadership Summit now. I urge you all to stay safe, to stay positive, to believe that we are winners as a nation and that we will come out as winners at the end. And we look forward to your support for the 2022 Summit. In conclusion, thank you very much. Stay safe and we value your support. Thank you.